Joe, uh, <laughs> this is take two out of some technical issues last time, but we managed, we've managed to nail it. Uh, I think you know what I'm going to say, and you've probably heard it a million times before at the minute um, with, uh, from other people, but thank you for what you're doing at the moment in the hospitals, especially in the ICU and all of your colleagues and everybody there. How are the stress levels? They're a bit higher than usual, I would say. Um, work's changed a fair bit, especially in the last couple of weeks. It's been a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, so, do you want to explain what, how, how I work, where I work? Go for it, yeah. Okay. I want to say so like Joe like. Okay. I work in ICU. So, normally I come in, I get allocated to a patient that's critically ill, and that can be anything from aneurysms to head injuries to road traffic accidents, post-surgical complications, pretty much anything across the board could end up in ICU. Um, we, we do 12 and a half hour shifts and for that time we are one-to-one -one with that patient. Um, we do hourly observations, we run infusion pumps, we do blood gases, sometimes they need dialysis, um, you know, various different things depending on how much support the individual patient needs. Um, since the whole COVID-19 thing has started. My service has had to split into two to separate COVID and non-COVID. So my normal ICU unit is still an ICU unit. And then we've set up a COVID ICU, which is in what used to be theater recoveries. Um, so basically we're still the same amount of staff, but we're now split over two sites. Um, and the hospital itself has built almost a COVID hospital within the hospital. We have an assessment unit. We have COVID wards, we have COVID high dependency units, and obviously where I work in the COVID um, ICU. So it's changed a fair bit. It's changed a fair bit. Were you doing 12 and a half hour shifts before it kicked off? Yeah, we were. In ICU, we were. A lot of the other nurses weren't, but are now being pulled in to do them. So we, That's we a long to... old shift. It is a long shift, but it's, it's better. It means less handovers. We, we do practically the same amount of work, but we get longer to do it. So... And there's only two shifts to cover rather than three or four. So it works better for us. It's a long day, but we get more days off as a result because our working day is longer. So it yeah. benefits us as well. Do, does it split between days and nights then? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I get really nervous. Um, yeah, we split. We do day shifts and night shifts, and it's just on a rolling rotor. There's no um, by more reason to it. It changes every month. Out of interest, which do you prefer, days or nights? Um, I prefer nights. Um, as I get older, they mess with me more. I don't recover as quickly from them, but there's less people around, so I can focus more on what I'm doing. Uh, and by people, I mean you know, physios, dietitians, lots of people come in the unit throughout the day that aren't there at night. So at night, you can get into more of a routine and you can focus more on your patient and what you're doing with them rather than having to deal with all these different distractions. So. Has um have has the hospital up the numbers of staff that it's got on at the moment compared to what it would pre normally have? Um, it, yeah, they put out a call for volunteers, so we've got lots of volunteers coming in. They've put out a call for people that have recently left, so people that have retired or gone to work in the community and things. A lot of them have come back to help us, which we're incredibly grateful for because, as you can imagine, being stretched pretty thin is a huge impact on our workload and how we manage as individual ICU nurses. We've gone from being one-to-one -one looking after one patient, we can be stretched as far as looking after three or four. So we need every person that we can get to help us at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the patients that are coming in, and I'm not just talking about COVID, I'm talking about your normal, your normal runner run-of-the-mill stuff, if you want to use that yeah. term. Um, has there been a, a, a perceptible change in the interaction between patients and staff now compared to before COVID hit? Is it, because in, and I, I, the reason I ask is definitely, you know, when you're seeing people about now and even just on your streets and your neighbours over the fence, mm -hmm. there's a definite positive uptick. In yeah. the interaction going on between people. What's that like in the hospitals? Um, it's difficult to assess because visiting is pretty much ground to halt at the minute. So we don't see as many visitors. 
patients that are coming in are obviously still quite concerned and worried. Um, anyone coming into that kind of environment is a bit on high alert at the moment because of COVID being around. And you, you're looking at everyone thinking, oh, God, have they got it? I've got it. They've got it. So it's difficult to assess it in the hospital, but I definitely see it in the community. People are much more willing to ask you about your job, how you're getting on. I've had so many messages from friends and family all the time. You know, are you safe? Are you getting all the equipment? People, the things that pe people wouldn't even have thought about before is now more on their radar. So they see things more from our point of view, I think. Um, and just walking around the neighborhood, all the rainbow pictures in the window, and we get them sent to us at work. That, that's just been amazing. That's it's really lovely to see that kind of yeah. outpouring of support for us. You know, we used to be in denied pay rises and things. You know, we were never that high on people's radars. So it's, it's nice to be appreciated now. Yeah, it is amazing to see. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was talking um, to someone else about this. And the, uh, it makes me really happy that my kids have got um, a marked up or uh, what's the word? A conscious now respect and and positive perception NHS that yeah. I wouldn't have been able to teach them on my own without something like this. And, and, and as unfortunately it didn't yeah. happen. I mean, they'll be out tonight clapping. In fact, they go out with pots and pans now. They, 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 they don't do they'll clap with pots and pants, you know. Um, well, Jason's, and all mom, Jason's mom was on the phone going, "Jason, you better be out there with a pot and pan." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, um, it is. It is. It is amazing. It's. It, it is fun, as hard as it is for the NHS now. It is a, um, a, a fantastic foundation support that's that's building behind you guys now and all the other key workers. Yeah, um, exactly. Which hopefully People, sustain. Supermarkets, everyone. You know, these are all yeah, exactly. jobs that haven't been highly valued previously that are now in the public eye as such and are being valued. People appreciate what what people are doing. So. Yeah. yeah, which is good. When when we were talking yesterday, um, you mentioned you mentioned that the heart, the sort of heartbreaking aspect of people in the hospitals at, at their worst times and at the end of their life, die, it's dying long as the family's going yeah. down. It's something that I'd been thinking about last week, but from a funeral perspective, but people, the funeral, very few people can go to the funerals, if any, it's mm -hmm. very difficult. And I was since we talked yesterday, I was I I was trying to understand what what in the hospital that must look like from a how do you how can you manage someone who's does it happen where they're conscious it's end of life and they're conscious and they know it's happening um not where i work usually because when we come to intubate people that's when they're conscious so we tell them you know you're at the point now where we're struggling to ventilate you so we're going to have to put a tube down and put you off to sleep and I think that's the scariest part for them because they have to face that alone. Their relatives aren't with them. All they've got is nurses that are kitted up to the eyeballs. You can barely see our faces. Three layers of gloves to hold the hand. It's it's really difficult, I think. And it's really difficult as a nurse to be in that position as well because you want to reassure them and you want to say everything's going to be all right. But you don't want to not lie as such. I, mean, I had this at the end of last year with a normal... Uh, was it a flu? Yeah, I think it was a flu patient that came into our unit, needed intubated. I reassured her, and she literally died within a couple of hours because we just couldn't ventilate her. And I went home and I blubbed on Jason, and I was like, you know, I feel awful. I feel like I lied to her. And he was just like, what kind of nurse would you be if you didn't reassure her? So that's your job. Yeah. What well, What can you do though? It's a It's a balance, isn't it, Joe? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd probably do the same as what you do. You want people to be in as, as best yeah. state of mind as they come and they go. And yeah. if that means a, a little white lie. Yeah, and the intention yeah. is truthful because we are doing our best. Our, our aim is always to get people back out, you know, out of intensive care and get them better. So the intention is good. It just doesn't always work out that way, unfortunately. But as a, normally within ICU, you're the patient advocate, but you also look after the relatives. So you, you kind of deal with that as a... Um, as a cohort almost, you know, you, you support each other through it. But this is so different because the relatives aren't there. So that it's just an, another layer of heartbreak that the doctors are having to phone them to tell them their um, family members died or, and even the doctors have been in tears at work with that. 
how uh, for the conscious patients, how are the families able to communicate? Is it by phone? I take it. Um, uh, well, some of them don't. Some of them are too unwell to use their phones, or just too wiped out, tired. Um, we we do most of the updating. Some people can use their phones, if, especially if they're more in the high dependency areas or the the ward areas. Obviously, they can use their phones, no problem. But within ICU, it's a bit more difficult because by the time they come to us, they're that unwell that they're not really managing. All their efforts and focus are going on keeping breathing mostly. Um, we seen is it yesterday or this morning. Uh, it hit the news that the UK has asked the USA I, I'm not sure if it's true or not, I'm assuming it is but mm. then it might not be they've asked the USA for 400 ventilators I think to come over What mm. what what's the impact of this lack of ventilators uh, what, uh, the, pr- the practical impact of the lack of ventilators on the on the shop mm-hmm. floor if you like in, in, the, yeah. in the ICU, what, what is the impact of it? Um, I think in, within where I work, we're managing okay. We're, we're a big hospital for you know, a relatively small number of patients because we're spread over such a wide area. We've managed all right so far, touch wood. <laughs> we've been proactively sourcing other ventilators, so we've brought some back from, um, I think, Perth, which is the nearest city. There's some coming across from there. We've our medical physics department were in the news yesterday, actually, because they've managed to convert anaesthetic machines into usable ventilators, which is brilliant. So that's given us a few more. Um, so we is were that actually, a new, is, that a new, is that a new development? Is they just well, it's not a new development. They've just um, so the machine has just been adapted for use as a ventilator. They would normally use it within the operating theatre to anaesthetise people. So it'd be a mixture of gases and whatever they. I'm not. I don't ask me the technical stuff. I'm not that clever, but they've adapted them so that we can use them as ventilators, which is brilliant. So that gives us an extra, I don't know how many. But. I wonder if that's been done elsewhere. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. really. Yeah. And I think the the UK government's tasked James Dyson to make some, apparently, and things like that. So. There's all sorts of stuff going, yeah, crazy it's stuff really going on. Yeah, I mean, But when you look at what people are doing with 3D printers as well, like, the, I was talking about a 15 year old school kid who was making straps for nurses' heads so that the masks weren't behind their ears. Have you seen that? Yeah, the, the plastic straps. That they, yeah, that's amazing. The elastic bands that could be behind the ears. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even just yeah. little things like that. It's incredible what people can come up with when they're under a bit of duress or when they want to help. So. Uh, again, it goes back to that point um, that at the, it, it takes the, like the hardest times. Not a point we mentioned in this podcast. I think we spoke about it yesterday. It takes the hardest times to bring out the best in people. Bring and the out most, resilience, yeah. yeah. The resilience, the the innovation, uh, and it's rubbish that it has to happen like that. It's rubbish that it has to happen like this. Um, but that's what makes what, the good come out of a situation like this, isn't it? Because you see the the best side of people. You see the worst of people as well, but mostly you see the best of people you see communities pulling together and helping each other out you see i see it within my work team at work we've all we all support each other we've all got each other's backs and we're constantly asking each other you're all right you're all right you know looking out for each other trying to have a giggle still at work still doing the stupid tiktok dances in our full ppe and trying to keep our morale up but <laughs> What's the feeling on the ground with, with you guys? I'm talking specifically, you can't obviously speak for, for the whole of the UK, but specifically to um, you and your colleagues in, in the mm-hmm. hospital there, of the the sort of length of time we, we can expect this to go on for? Um, I think the general consensus is that we've not yet fully peaked. So there's still a lot of planning going on. There's still a lot of preparation going on. We're still expecting more to come, but we're... We've looked at what's happened in Italy, obviously. We're looking at what's happening in London. And I think we're always a bit of a step behind up in Scotland from from what's going on down south. So we've got more time to prepare. I, I don't think it's uh, I, I don't think it's spiking here in the UK as hard as it did in, it's in Spain, did it? If you look at their numbers, yeah, and they're, they're like two weeks ahead of us. Hopefully social distancing is doing the, the job. That's what we needed. We needed people to stay in. And it's not a case of, um, you know, you're not staying in because you yourself won't get over it. You know, most people will have a mild illness, but it's the people that don't 
we can't afford to, for everyone to get sick at the same time because that overwhelms the resources that we've got. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, it's it's that having that awareness that, like you said, it's not about yourself. It's the second and third mm-hmm. connection impact. So I, yeah. I'm divorced. I can't see my girls. They they them and their mum. They've all got asthma. Um, and so it's just not worth the risk to, yeah. to see them. Um, but even if I was, I, I, if, even if I was able to, I wouldn't because I know that they're in contact with their their grandparents. Yeah. And so it's not me impacting the girls, it's me impacting their grandparents. And, yeah, and, and exactly. If, I think they're still in contact with the grandparents anyway, but um, either way, it's, and people just don't have that awareness because it's not, it's not hitting them directly. It's not hitting them yeah. directly. And I think the worst thing that happened was at the start, it was made out, you know, this only affects older people. So we had a whole generation of people going, ah, well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't affect me then. So I'll just carry on as normal. Yeah. But as it's gone on, we obviously we've seen it, it's, it yeah. affects a far broader range of people. And what's odd with it um, is the way it can impact younger generations of people who are seemingly completely healthy. Yeah. Well, it's, we're not entirely it's, it's, sure what's going on there yet, so... One of the things that's come out around around this is, uh, and I don't know if you're aware of, it, aware of it, but apparently people with an A-type blood group are are more vulnerable to, to viruses anyway. I'm not just talking COVID, but they're generally more vulnerable to viruses, A-type blood group. Is that uh, is that true? I haven't heard Do it, you know? but thanks for that, Hugh, because I'm a positive. <laughs> I, I'm a neck. I'm a neck. <laughs> I heard it from a virologist. I heard it from a virologist, an American virologist called no. something. Like that. Yeah, apparently it's common knowledge. Oh, right, but then okay. I don't get that ill. So, <laughs> I got touch wood, touch wood. Yeah. My colleagues and myself, we're all a bit scared. We'd be lying if if we said we weren't. You know what I mean? A lot of my senior colleagues are over fifty. We've got a few colleagues that can't work with COVID patients because of asthma, because of immunosuppressive drugs or whatever they're on so there is a couple that are exempt and rightly so they should be but then they suffer from the guilt that they're not in the thick of it with us uh, but when you say they're exempt they're still going to the hospital aren't they they're, they're just still not working co- yeah they're still working still they're, just not, risk there, man. they're still not they're just not put with covid patients um but yeah i mean i probably feel safest on, on, on a day-to-day basis, I still have to go to the supermarket and I still have to do my shopping and I probably feel less safe there than I do at work because at work I've got the full gear on. And at work I trust our policies and our procedures and I trust my managers and my bosses to keep me safe because that's their job. So as long as I do everything right at work, hopefully I'll be okay. There's no guarantee. And as as, yeah, and as long as uh, everyone in the UK does what they do, then we'd all be okay. Yeah. We but we are, we are scared. We're scared of bringing it home to our partners and children. We're all a bit obsessive now about showering after work. So a 12 and a half hour shift turns into a 13 and a half hour shift by the time you get home. Um, you know, we, we take nothing out of the COVID ICU. Everything stays there. Pens. We don't take our badges in. We don't take paperwork out. Nothing. And, you know, that to even set up a second ICU, the whole logistical undertaking of that, when you think that you need beds, you need ventilators, you need pumps, you need feeding pumps, you need monitors, you need linen to go in every day, you need you know, liquid feed to go in every day, you need the x-ray machine to be able to go in and out, you need the domestics to be able to go in and out, everything, the logistical hugeness of it is mind-blowing. What we've pulled off is pretty good, actually. The systems that we have are pretty good. Yeah, right. I, I, I completely overlooked that until you said it. Obviously, yeah, the logistical aspect must be... Uh, and there was a few teething problems. Like we had to work out the way for staff to go in and out of what is now COVID ICU. So the pathway for that, literally, we needed like the donning area to put on all the gear and then the doffing area. And we, we had issues with the doffing area that the hand gels kept disappearing. So the last thing you take off is your mask. And that's done outside the doffing area, so in the corridor, basically. Mask off into the bin, and then straight away you'd hand gel your hands, and the gels kept going missing, so they had to wall mount them. Not patients. Patients nicking them. We don't know. <laughs> you can speculate. I'll speculate. Flipping patients nicking them. Yeah, no, uh, it's, uh, it is some amazing stuff going on with, this, with, the, with the new hospitals being set up, with mm, the conversion yeah. of the stuff that's going on, like, at your hospital. Um 
I'm just looking at the time. We'll we'll we got a, a, a few minutes left. Is there anything else you want to mention? Re NHS, re work. Um, I want to thank my colleagues. I work with a great team, and I don't mean just doctors and nurses. I mean healthcare assistants. I mean admin um, assistants. I mean the dietitians, the physios. You know, we're we're a massive team, and we can't run without all of us working together. And that includes domestics, porters. You know, a lot of these people are getting overlooked now. We're all being hailed heroes, doctors and nurses. And uh, all these people are helping, keeping the machine running. We need them all. So I just want to thank all my colleagues for that. Absolutely. All your colleagues, everyone in the background that aren't getting the, that heroes uh, mm-hmm. hashtag. And uh, and outside the NHS as well, like you mentioned. Oh, we're not heroes so, because we're, still, we're going to work. Little things are maybe heroic. The fact that we're still going in when we're shit scared. <laughs> But we're not heroes. We're just doing our job. And we went into nursing to care for people. We didn't go in for the wage packet, that's for sure. But we went in to care for people. And that's what we're still trying to do. So if people could just stay at home over Easter, that'd be great. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Um, Right. Where can people find you? In fact, Headshed Base. So just... So do, do, do a quick mention about the Headshed Base, Joe. So Headshed Base is something that Jason and I are setting up. It's um, it's not charity, it's a business as such, but it's to help people that have gone through trauma and have been through therapy and when they come out the other side. We were looking mostly at veterans, um, but I think this whole pandemic might change our client base somewhat. Um, it's in its infancy. We've had a few setbacks. Firstly, trying to find a location, which we've now managed to find the perfect place. But thanks to all this going on and social distancing, we've not been able to get out there to do anything further. But we've said all along, we're not in a hurry to get it done. We're in a hurry to get it done properly. So while it's on hold at the minute, we'll we'll get back to that. Uh, at Headshed Base on Instagram, right? That's right, yeah. Perfect. Listen... I know you don't think so. You're doing amazing work, and uh, and so are all your colleagues. So thank you to all of those people, and uh, might get you and Jason in the studio at some point in the future. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And thanks very much for letting me tell the nursing side of it. It's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. <laughs>